It was to be an epic journey. I would travel from the UK over land and sea to Egypt to attempt the legendary 10,000 mile Trans-African Odyssey. Cairo to the Cape. I'd viewed my other African trips through the lens of a camera, but this one would be different. I'd leave the camera behind. But now, almost 40 years later, I regret not taking that camera. I think I invented selfies. That's me in Uganda. And that's me in Zambia. And that's me looking miserable at Johannesburg Airport. You see, after 23 weeks and 10,000 miles, 18 countries, four canoes, five trucks, seven share taxis, eight boats, 14 trains, 17 buses. I ran out of money in South Africa, in Johannesburg. I had failed dismally almost 40 years ago as the jumbo swept up and away from Johannesburg that glittering city framed in the aircraft window I vowed to return to South Africa to return one day to complete the journey to the Cape and take a camera this is KwaZulu Natal a province of South Africa lying between Johannesburg and the Indian Ocean Meet Carl, my travelling companion. Later, we will join our wives in Cape Town to complete the trip. But until then, we both have places we need to see. When we were at school, this land had another name. A name with the taint of imperialism, war and occupation. A name bled into the histories of South Africa and Britain. Zululand. On our journey to the Cape of Good Hope, our first stop was on the banks of the Yomzinyati River to visit the misdeeds of our forefathers. Our first night in KwaZulu-Natal was memorable. This is truly an elemental land of earth, fire and sky. I have woken to countless African dawns, but this one would be different and soaked in uncomfortable history. Here is a landscape of wildness, of gorges and rolling hills, scattered communities, graveled roads, vast plains and broad rivers.
140 years ago, a column of British troops crossed this, the Umzinyati River, and invaded Zululand. My name is Mpiwa. Mpiwa, yes. M-P-H-I-W-A. The British aim was to defeat King Chetsweo's Zulu army. As the column marched achingly slowly across the landscape, a 25,000 strong Zulu army lay ready. Among them, Mpiwa's grandfather and great-grandfather. The British underestimated King Chetsweo. By mid-afternoon, January 22nd, 1879, the slopes of this sphinx-like mountain called Islangwana were drenched with Victorian blood. A Zulu victory that shook Victoria's empire to its core. This is Isiku. It's a necklace of bravery awarded after a battle. The San Luana, the mountain itself, it's a monument to our people. Few places feel as eerie and abandoned as this Luana. If there are spirits of the dead, of warriors, they still walk here. Each cairn shrouds the remains of British soldiers. Away in the hills lie the bones of young Zulu men. This is not a field of glory, a scene of flag waving. It is a place to look deep into our souls. A few tried to escape Islangwana on horseback. Across the fleeing fugitive's path raged the Umzinyati. Attempting to rescue the regimental flag, Lieutenants Melville and Coghill crossed the Umzinyati. But the flag was snatched by the torrent. The two exhausted men began an ascent of this awful slope. In a flash and glint of spears, they lost their lives here. But the bloodshed was not over. A regiment of 4,000 Zulu fell upon the mission station of Rourke's Drift. James Rourke had come here in 1849. He had a really good relationship with the Zulus from Zululand. Manned and by Zulus fewer than 150 British soldiers, the successful defence of Rourke's Drift has become a British time, legend. The British had prepared their Martini hand rifles very well. He started firing at this retiring mess. With just voice hands. and a stick, Zulu ah, blood coursing down. through his Easy. veins, Brian brought that ferocious Zulu fight to desperate see, reality. See, 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 where are they? Where are they? Where are they? I have absolutely no idea how this must have felt for the British soldiers here. The unimaginable courage of warring men animated Brian's stories. But any national pride hidden deep in us listeners drained away as we all quietly asked ourselves, why? Because of the brutality that they had shown going after the sick man inside the hospital there. They would not be forgiven. They would meet that bayonet of a Martini hand rifle. They would be killed and they would be brought to be buried together with their brothers here. All journeys are about movement and big journeys unfold across hundreds of miles. And South Africa is a huge country, five times bigger than the UK. My journey was nearing its end. 
half a lifetime after it began. Conceived in frustration and ending in failure, those 10,000 miles changed my life. I saw things I wish I could recall more clearly, vividly remember events I wish I could forget. I made friends, was often scared, often hungry and often alone. I became ill, grew better, climbed mountains, descended into volcanoes, felt humbled and sometimes elated and I gained a deep respect for the trials of African people. Carl and I headed to the Indian Ocean coast, swinging southwest onto what is known as the Garden Route toward a distant Cape Town. Here is a benign, semi-tropical, almost Mediterranean landscape with surprises for the most jaded traveller. The sea is never far away. Here it feels like the booming edge of the world. Indeed, the next landfall south is the icy waste of Antarctica. being lured back to the ocean, the crashing waves and cleansing wind drew us down to the tide, time after time. But soon, that hurrying thrill of nearing our destination took over. One journey can often feel just like a roundabout way to travel home. But there was something special when, instead, home came to meet us. These are the Twelve Apostles, which guard the western flanks of Cape Town's iconic Table Mountain. Staring out across Camps Bay towards Lion's Head, the cold South Atlantic beating upon the shore.
to the east are South Africa's winelands, where we paused for a while. Soon, the inexorable pull of the destination drew us south, the route to the Cape. It's an odd feeling to reach the end of the road, a swirl of joy mixed with self-doubt. What did I discover by coming here? Was it worth it? In that wild wind at the edge of the world, oh yes, how glad I was that all those years ago, I took the road less travelled.